when Kukusaka was a child, he always admired firefighters. He harbored a dream of becoming a hero just like them. Alas, that aspiration remained unfulfilled. By the age of 29, Ku found himself in an unfamiliar place, drifting in an empty void. The last thing he remembered was taking the train home after working late. Suddenly, a holographic screen materialized in front of him. The screen displayed a message informing him that he had been summoned to another world. It also presented him with three life choices. Firstly, a brave a warrior of great fate. Secondly, a wise man a magician with power beyond common sense. And thirdly, a demon lord a dark ruler consumed by desire. Ku, believing it to be a mere dream, played along. He declined the option of the brave, feeling inadequate for such a grand destiny. He dismissed the wise man, aware that he lacked the intelligence for the title. And he refused the demon lord for the same reason as the other two. He inquired if he could opt out of the choices. To his surprise, the hologram congratulated him, unveiling a hidden fourth option. It stated that he would be endowed with substandard abilities and transferred to another world. The transfer commenced, and Ku suddenly found himself in a dense forest surrounded by trees and plants. The reality struck him that this was not a dream, he was indeed in another world. He checked his suit pockets and found his smartphone, wallet, and a few tissues. Pondering his next move in this forest, another hologram appeared before him, this time displaying a status menu akin to those found in RPG games. Ku noted his unusually high MP levels and queried its abundance. A new hologram emerged to elucidate the concept of MP. His gaze then shifted to a skill listed in his status called Full Assist. Yet another hologram materialized, asking if he wished to employ full assist to expedite the skill installation. He consented, and a deluge of knowledge inundated his mind. Putting his newfound knowledge to the test, Ku employed the item box skill to store a tree within his dimensional storage. Discovering the skill's convenience, he subsequently utilized dismantle on the tree, reducing it to chopped wood. He then exercised his creation skill to transform the wood into sticks. Upon examination, he realized these were not ordinary sticks. They bore special effects, were exceptionally durable and incombustible. He was notified that his creation skill had leveled up to level 2 from usage, indicating an increased array of recipes available for creation as the skill advanced. Curious about dismissing the holographic windows, Ku found that they transitioned to image mode, enabling him to visualize them mentally rather than having them physically manifest. He then experimented with other recipes he had acquired. Ku crafted a wooden axe that boasted the sharpness of a metal one, complete with the effects of critical hit and hit correction. Testing its sharpness, he flung the axe at a nearby rock using his dexterity skill. To his amazement, it cleaved through the rock effortlessly. Acknowledging his partial understanding of the skills, Ku was determined that he could survive in this new world with the knowledge he possessed. Deciding to further level up his creation skill, he cleared a sizable portion of the forest. In doing so, he elevated creation to level 5 and acquired insights into the skill's development. It leveled up only after accumulating certain experience points, Experience was gained exclusively via new recipes, and using previously utilized recipes yielded no additional experience. Eight new recipes were now at his disposal, including an unusual wooden chair with the strange effect of inducing sleep with a single hit. With an intention to reach a town before sundown, Ku set out. His journey was unimpeded by fatigue thanks to his transfer skill, which substantially augmented his physical and mental faculties and granted him fluency in the language of this world. As his five senses were heightened, a scream caught his attention. He darted towards the sound and came upon an armored bear attacking a merchant. Ku had the option to flee, as the bear hadn't noticed him, but the desire to live up to his childhood aspiration of helping others overcame his fear. With resolve, Ku retrieved his axe from his item box and hurled it at the bear's neck, neatly decapitating it. After rescuing the merchant, Ku received thanks from him. The merchant introduced himself as Chrome, and Ku, pondering the extent of honesty he should use, similarly introduced himself. 
Concerned about making a strange impression while desiring a guide to the nearest town, Ku opted for a more mundane persona. Holding the armored bear's head he had slain, along with his wooden axe, he informed Chrome that he was a craftsman. Chrome, somewhat skeptical due to Ku's unusual appearance for a craftsman, questioned whether he had crafted the impressive axe that felled an armored bear with a single blow. In response to Ku's ignorance of the armored bear's strength, Chrome explained it's a rank monster status and the immense power it wielded, which could destroy entire villages during a rampage. Ku was taken aback, considering he dispatched the beast effortlessly with a wooden axe. As the sun began to set, Chrome expressed his intention to return home and invited Ku to accompany him. Inquiring about the abandoned carriage, Ku learned that both the coachman and horse had fled in terror. Seizing the opportunity, Ku offered to store the carriage using his dimensional storage ability from his item box skill, which had unlimited capacity. Chrome, astonished by Ku's skills, increasingly doubted his simple woodworker story, but accepted Ku's explanation of isolation in the mountains and consequent lack of common sense. On their trek to the town of Anan, Ku inquired about the world's workings, learning two crucial points. First, the world's skills were innate, divided into talent and intelligent types, with individuals limited to possessing only three. Second, contrary to Ku's unique capability, others could not enhance their skills through monster slaying. Chrome revealed that despite the rarity of highway monsters, he did hire an escort. Yet the mercenaries abandoned him in the face of the armored bear threat. Upon reaching the city gates of Anan, they encountered a commotion. The cowardly mercenaries were misleading the guards about Chrome's supposed demise. After Chrome and Ku made their presence known, the guards were initially dubious of Ku's martial prowess. To vindicate Chrome's account, Ku produced the head of the armored bear from his item box, which corroborated their story and exposed the mercenaries' deceit. An incensed mercenary's attempt on Chrome's life was thwarted by Ku with a chair from his item box. Subsequently, Ku subdued the aggressor, earning adulation from the townspeople and apprehension from the guards. Following an interrogation, Ku gained access to the city thanks to Chrome's support. Ku, now in Chrome's company, was awed by the vastness of Chrome's abode, which was more a mansion than a house. They were welcomed by staff and offered lavish hospitality, inciting Ku's desire to prolong his stay. Reflecting on his former world and finding nothing to return to, Ku resolved to settle in this new realm. The following day, Chrome pledged lodging for a month as gratitude, suggesting Ku dwell in an inn his company managed for a comprehensive experience of the town. Ku learned Chrome wasn't merely a merchant, but the head of the significant Scarlet Company, soon to step down for his son's succession. Chrome expressed his gratitude for encountering Ku before retirement. He imparted wisdom on the utility of skills, noting Ku's adeptness, and advised him to join the Adventurer's Guild. To be taken seriously there, Chrome suggested shedding formal attire and speech. Ku considered where to procure armor but realized, with his crafting skill, he could create armor from the armored bear's remains including a shoulder pad bearing its head. Donning his homemade armor, Ku made a striking entrance at the Adventurer's Guild, captivating the resident adventurers with his appearance. When Ku entered the Adventurer's Guild, murmurs spread among the crowd, he was the fabled bear slayer. Approaching the reception, the male receptionist retreated in fear. Ku turned to the other receptionist named Milia, who greeted him warmly with a smile. How may I assist you? she inquired. Ku expressed his wish to register as an adventurer. Milia, taken aback, admitted that, judging by his gear, she had mistaken him for a high-ranking adventurer from abroad. Ku clarified that he was, in fact, a novice. Obliging, Milia handed him a form and explained that after completion, he would need to undergo a practical exam. Ku filled out the form, noting under the appeal section, I'm not adept at handling rough situations, which made Milia suspect he was jesting. However, he assured her of his seriousness, conveying his desire to evade combat when possible. Accepting his stance for the time being, she inquired whether he was prepared for the immediate commencement of the practical exam. Ku, curious, asked about the exam details. Milia disclosed that it entailed sparring with a companion adventurer.
today's examiner being a former a rank adventurer rumored to surpass an armored bear in strength. They made their way to the underground training area, trailed by a throng of adventurers eager to witness the spectacle. Milia checked if Ku was comfortable, reassuring him that victory wasn't necessary to achieve adventurer status. Extracting his massive wooden mallet from his item box skill, Ku declared he wouldn't hold back. The mallet, though imposing in size, was surprisingly light, benefiting from an enchantment that fortified its wielder. His effortless swing of the burdensome mallet astonished onlookers. Jai's, the advanced adventurer and Ku's opponent, appeared, acknowledging Ku's formidable presence despite his youth and vowed to reveal the existence of greater strength. Ku, recognizing Jai's experience, resolved to remain vigilant. Milia signaled the beginning of the duel. Initially, both contestants stood motionless, anticipating the other's move. Jai's prompted Ku to advance, stressing that he was the test subject. Ku lunged and swung, yet Jai's nimbly dodged, advising Ku that his expansive attacks left vulnerable gaps. Suddenly, Ku retracted his mallet into his item box skill, gaining agility without the mallet's encumbrance, and narrowly dodged Jai's sword thrust. Retrieving the mallet, he then struck Jai's sword, shattering it completely. Milia declared the fight over and Ku the victor amidst roaring cheers. A dumbfounded Jais congratulated him, thanking Ku for the unique item box technique displayed. They shook hands, and Jais admitted his lofty expectations for Ku. Milia extended Ku his adventurous card, praising his remarkable strength and confessing her surprise at his swift victory. Although Ku attributed his triumph to his acquired skills, he withheld this out of respect for the instructor. Milia provided him with a guidebook on adventuring and offered a primer on the essentials. She delineated the ranking system, regulations and quest accepting procedures. Ku likened the system to an RPG game. She informed him that reaching rank B would entail injury compensation and a retirement pension. Determined to attain rank B, Ku considered his strategy. Milia recommended a herb-gathering mission as a start. He inquired further, and she elaborated on the quest to collect naos grass, commonly found near the forest and used predominantly in medicines. The task, issued by the pharmacist guild, promised a reward of 400 cosma per grass. Ku deemed the terms favorable. Milia advised that a novice adventurer's initial quest requires the company of a high-ranking adventurer. Confident, she left to find an appropriate partner. Ku reflected gratefully on Chrome's recommendation to adventure and the generous gift of 80,000 Cosma. Milia returned with Iris Newt Fafnir of the Dragonfolk tribe and a rank adventurer. Iris glanced at Ku, then affably requested he address her simply as Iris. Ku over politely introduced himself. Iris eased his nerves, advising him to speak naturally. To pair Ku's mountain upbringing with Iris's divergence from human norms seemed an ideal match, as explained by Milia. After Ku and Iris introduced themselves, they embarked on their quest. Along the journey, Iris inquired about their first course of action, to which Ku responded that they needed to collect information. He had developed this habit from marking cheat website pages when exploring new games. Ku admitted his ignorance about the appearance and habitat of Naos Grass and expressed a desire to consult the monster distribution map. Iris commended him, pointing out that the booklet handed to them by Milia contained all the necessary information. Upon opening the booklet, Ku found a wealth of useful data. Iris mentioned that Milia had authored the booklet herself. Ku, realizing he required supplies, led the way to the adventurer's street. There, they purchased a rope, a torch, a water bag, and a flint. Ku stored these items in his magical item box, whose capacity amazed Iris when she learned it was unlimited. She informed him that the item box skill was relatively uncommon and that there were more potent magical items. Demonstrated by Iris as she effortlessly pulled a spear from a small waist pouch, she explained that such magical storage was commonplace among adventurers and that Ku's item box skill was indeed atypical. Their journey continued towards Cello Forest in search of Naos grass. Upon locating it, Iris warned that it should not be plucked carelessly. It required a scooper for proper extraction to prevent the leaves from detaching. 
Ku cleverly utilized his item box skill to store and retrieve the grass intact, much to Iris's surprise. When they stumbled upon nail on a grass, marked distinctively by dark spots, Iris elucidated the challenge of their quest. Distinguishing Naos grass from its look-alike required diligence and patience, as they needed to gather fifty specimens before sundown. Ku, undeterred, activated his artisan's god's eye skill, which made all the Naos grass in the vicinity visible and greatly expedited their mission. An hour later, the quest was complete. As they traveled back to town, Ku probed Iris with questions, eventually delving into personal territory. He inquired about her dragon folk heritage. Iris shared that dragons, revered as the Earth's ancient rulers, were the forebears of her people, imbuing dragon folk with exceptional strength and longevity compared to humans. Ku's fascination and admiration were atypical, as humans tend to maintain a distance from the dragon folk out of fear. Upon their return, Milia was astounded at their rapid completion of the quest. Ku's explanation of their method impressed her, and he received the 20,000 Cosma as a reward. Congratulations were exchanged, marking the successful end of his first quest. Ku retired to an inn recommended by Chrome, donned his old suit, and scoured Milia's booklet for an affordable dining option, eventually savoring grilled chicken that he found delicious and worthy of the expense. The following day brought Ku to the Fado's Mountains on a new quest to hunt five lonely wolves. Despite his initial lack of success in finding them, he busied himself crafting potions, a healing potion with a mint taste and a detoxification potion he found delicious, using potion ingredients he had stumbled upon and the water bags from his earlier purchases. A lone wolf's appearance startled Ku just as he was testing his concoctions, and he prepared for battle with his sword at the ready. After the wolf appeared, Ku swiftly drew his sword from the dimensional storage of his item box skill. As the wolf charged at him, he leveraged his dexterity skill to cleave the beast in two, astonished by the sharpness of his blade. He proceeded to collect the wolf's carcass, depositing it in his item box, skill only four more wolf defeats were necessary to complete his quest. Suddenly, noises alerted him to a new threat, a pack of wolves positioned behind him. The wolves lunged toward Ku, who began to dispatch them with efficient strokes of his sword. Mid-battle, a notification popped up to announce he had attained a level up and acquired the automatic collection skill, which conveniently stored the fallen wolves in his item box post-mortem. In a grim turn, another pack of wolves emerged. Ku engaged in a relentless battle, accumulating an alarming total of 2,031 wolf corpses in his item box. With a mental note to report this abnormal phenomenon to the Adventurer's Guild, Ku began his trek back to town. En route, another wolf, a solitary female pregnant one that preyed on male wolves, crossed his path. Ku ended this threat as well, advancing to level 16. He pondered the progression of his skills amidst his significant leveling that day. As he considered pausing by a pond for a respite, he noticed two adventurers a girl and a boy clearly exhausted and panting for breath. Upon Ku's inquiry about their well-being, they initially reacted with alarm but recognized him as the renowned Bear Slayer. Introductions aside, they urged him to swiftly vacate the mountains due to a loose black spider. While they were novice E-rank adventurers here on a quest, a dragon folk named Iris, and a rank adventurer, had intervened to save them from the formidable A-plus rank arachnid. Driven by concern, Ku inquired about the sighting of the black spider by which they pointed him in the direction it was last seen. Despite the boy's apprehensions, the girl, having trusted insights from the spirits, condoned Ku's decision to seek out Iris. These spirits she mentioned were potent, invisible entities controlling aspects of nature. If a shared trust in the spirits and cautionary advice, they let Ku depart toward the Black Spider's last known location. Activating a skill to heighten his auditory perception, Ku raced forth, preoccupied with thoughts of Iris's safety and an unexpected personal investment in her welfare. Approaching the sounds of conflict, he was met with the sight of Iris, wounded and prone. Ku realized the potential for a trap just as the Black Spider surged from beneath the soil. After confronting the black spider, Ku uses his appraisal skill to discern its abilities. 
he discovers that the spider possesses a magic-resistant body and hemp poison fangs. Impressed by its cunning, as it had used Iris as bait to draw him in, Ku acknowledges the spider's intelligence. However, when the spider launches itself at Ku, he agilely dodges the attack. With swift movements, he retrieves his sword from his item box and strikes at the spider. Unfortunately, the slashes are too shallow to inflict significant harm. Realizing the urgency, Ku knows he must defeat the spider promptly to rescue Iris before time runs out. The spider renews its assault, and this time it manages to land a blow, sending Ku crashing into a tree. His armor is the only thing that saves him. As he regains his bearings, Ku notes that he has dropped his sword. He must retrieve it quickly. Before he can act, the spider ensnares him in a web, binding him to the tree. Ku struggles, but the web proves too resilient. As the spider creeps closer, intent on delivering its venomous bite, Ku racks his brain for a solution. The answer comes to him in the form of his item box skill, which allows for the storage of objects in a dimensional space. He uses this skill to store the tree and the web, freeing himself from the spider's trap. Once freed, Ku quickly recovers his sword. Spotting Iris's spear on the ground, he seizes it, wielding it alongside his sword. He re-engages the black spider, slashing with his sword and thrusting with the spear. It then dawns on him that his previous inability to hit the spider stemmed from his impatience. As the black spider attempts to flee, Ku hurls the spear, pinning it to the ground. He follows through by cleaving the monster in two with his sword. His victory is compounded by a notification his level has increased to 24, and he has unlocked the skill auto-mapping, which will enable him to view a map of his surroundings. Ku wastes no time in attending to Iris. Upon examining her, he confirms that she is alive, but in need of immediate medical attention. He retrieves a healing potion from his item box and applies it to her wounds. He watches, hopeful that the potion will take effect. Iris's wounds begin to close, she regains consciousness and in her confusion urges Ku to flee from the black spider. Ku assures her that the threat is eliminated. He inquires if she is experiencing any other issues, to which she responds that she has been affected by the spider's paralyzing poison. Ku administers a detoxifying potion and following her quick recovery from the paralysis, Iris expresses her gratitude. Ku, half-jokingly, suggests that her thanks could take the form of a dinner invitation. This prompts Iris to tease him with the offer of a date, only to reveal she was attempting to lighten the mood. She makes an effort to stand but promptly faints, at which point Ku catches her. He carries her on his back to the town. During their journey, Iris is curious about Ku's encounter with the spider and asks if he was afraid. Ku replies that fear never settled in, as his focus was on her safety, a comment that flusters Iris. She thanks him again for his bravery and the rescue. Upon returning to the Adventurer's Guild, Ku and Iris received a warm welcome from their peers, all of whom expressed relief at their safe return. Milia greeted Ku, inquiring if he would prefer dinner or a bath first. Ku, however, prioritized reporting the details of his quest. After ensuring that Iris was comfortably resting in a bed, Ku, accompanied by Milia, went to the reception office of the guild. There, before taking his report, Milia disclosed her identity to Ku by presenting an identification card that revealed her position as assistant branch manager of the Adventurer's Guild. Ku was taken aback, having assumed she was merely a receptionist, and questioned her about why she held such a role. Milia responded with a simple expression of her desire to be of assistance. She extended her deepest thanks to Ku for slaying the black spider, acknowledging the lives he had saved. As they delved into his report, Milia showed keen interest in the lone wolves Ku had encountered, noting the importance of reporting this to the guild's headquarters. Ku's revelation of single-handedly defeating 2,000 wolves only heightened her surprise, she was already aware of the Black Spider, thanks to a previous report from a fellow adventurer. Yet she was curious as to how Ku had managed to cure its venom that was otherwise known to have no antidote. Ku explained his creation of a potion, one of which he gave to the guild for further examination to derive a cure. Ku received news of his upcoming advancement in rank. 
Furthermore, Milia informed him about the reward they had prepared for the Black Spider's defection, a substantial sum of five million Cosma, explaining that the high reward reflected the typical necessity of multiple adventurers to overcome such a foe and the division of the bounty amongst them. Ku remembered the numerous adventurers who had come to his aid. When he inquired about Iris's reward, acknowledging her bravery in saving the young adventurers, Milia assured him that she was also set to receive a reward. Post-meeting, outside of the reception, Ku encountered Jais, who complimented his noteworthy achievement of killing the Black Spider. Jais asked about Ku's availability and subsequently invited him to a celebration at the Golden Bear Restaurant. There, Ku was greeted by the sight of the Onan city adventurers gathered to celebrate his victory. Iris's arrival, unfortunately, was overshadowed by others' avoidance due to her dragon folk heritage. Ku took it upon himself to encourage a young adventurer to publicly acknowledge Iris's bravery, ultimately leading the crowd in a toast to her valor. Ku harbored hopes for Iris to be integrated and accepted by the community. A span of ten days elapsed and Ku grew more accustomed to the city. He revealed his promotion from an F-rank to a D-rank adventurer, a record-breaking elevation. To advance to C-rank, Ku now faced the challenge of hunting C-rank monsters, gathering C-rank materials, and undertaking city quests akin to community service. Ku's first city quest took him to the Kinkumare restaurant, where he donned an apron crafted from wolf material and applied his dexterity along with his master chef skills to create the perfect sandwich. His second quest involved assisting with city wall renovations, clearing the area of debris which he expertly transported to a dwarven workshop using his item box ability. The dwarves expressed their gratitude by offering him a drink, but he respectfully declined, citing his work commitment. Following the completion of his quests, Ku returned to the guild to report his success and claim his reward. Outside, Iris congratulated him on his accomplishments and inquired about his free time. Upon confirmation, she extended an invitation to dinner, a routine that had become almost daily. That evening, they enjoyed beef stew at the Silver Stag restaurant, content with their meal. Ku shared with Iris that his presence in the city was purely coincidental and in turn inquired about her motivations for being there. Iris disclosed her mission, to seek out an underground city rumored to be beneath their very feet. Iris explained that an ancient civilization possessed advanced magic long before it ultimately vanished. Recent excavations have unearthed signs of a city beneath the current city of Anan. Ku has learned that this lost city is Iris's objective. He speculated whether it might contain ancient superweapons. Iris admitted she had gathered a significant amount of data on the city but had yet to pinpoint its precise location. Ku summoned a map with his auto-mapping skill, explaining that it covered the surrounding area and offered to share it with Iris. He instructed the map to reveal the ancient city's site, which it indicated near the Cello Forest. Impressed by the map's capabilities, Iris agreed to explore the site the next day. Upon reaching the Cello Forest the following morning, they initially discovered nothing. Ku revealed he had crafted a magic gauntlet from a black spider he had slain days earlier. While searching for a secret entrance, Ku came across an out-of-place rock. He attempted to move it using his strength, with no success. Iris suggested utilizing his item box skill to store the rock, which, when he did so, revealed a hidden door. Iris identified the door as being made of orichalcum, a rare, anti-magic metal whose processing techniques had been long forgotten. They contemplated how to enter, and Ku noticed some writing on the door. Reading it triggered a notification welcoming him to the underground city stating he must pass a provisional trial to enter. Immediately afterward, an Orichalcum golem appeared, targeting them. Iris advised Ku to flee while she distracted the S-rank monster, which normally required 20 A-rank adventurers to defeat. Ku declined, insisting they should attempt to confront it. When the golem unleashed a laser beam, Ku formulated a plan, inquiring how the golem had been defeated previously. Iris divulged that its only vulnerability was its eyes, which were unprotected by Orichalcum. Ku suggested they could prevail if they got close enough. Despite Iris's skepticism due to its laser attacks, Ku volunteered to shield her, 
allowing her to strike. As they charged, Ku took the lead with Iris behind him. He successfully blocked the laser with his black spider gauntlet, which had the power to absorb magic. Once close, Iris stabbed at the golem's eye with her spear, though the attack didn't immediately incapacitate the creature. As it tried to strike back at Iris, Ku restrained the golem with webbing from his gauntlet. With the golem immobilized, Ku seized the chance to strike its eye once more, this time fatally. Following their victory, Ku received a notification that he had advanced to level 38 and completed the trial, thus becoming the master of the underground city. They were left wondering if the door would now yield to them. Before attempting to open it, Iris expressed her gratitude to Ku for protecting her. The door then swung open, revealing a passageway into the depths. As Ku and Iris traversed the tunnel, Iris inquired whether Ku was a transferer. She elaborated that within the dragon folk's lore, a transfer is depicted as a peculiar being from a realm afar, reputed to hold an abundance of talents. Ku affirmed his identity as the transfer and pleaded with Iris for discretion. She consented, albeit with curiosity about his origins. She probed about his homeland, and Ku, hesitant to disclose his interworldly roots, opted to describe it as a distant place. Ku expressed regret for his secretive nature. Yet Iris reassured him of her unwavering trust. As they neared the tunnel's exit and hastened towards it, a wondrous natural tableau unfolded before them. Puzzled, Iris wondered if they were truly subterranean. Ku's gaze met the ceiling above, confirming their location underground. Suddenly, rustling in the grass announced an encounter. They armed themselves only to be met by a benign slime asserting its friendly intent. Ku's appraisal ability corroborated its claim. The slime, identifying itself as an auxiliary being, was soon joined by a throng of its kin who hailed Ku as their sovereign. One slime disclosed that this subterranean metropolis was envisioned as a safe haven. Right then, Ku received an alert. His assistance ability had evolved, unlocking his creative potential. He discovered two enhancements to his creation ability the use of mana as a constructive medium, and the capacity to erect structures from it. Ku anticipated delight in utilizing this talent. When inquired about a building directive ability, Ku negated possession, yet he confirmed having the creation ability, revered as divine and solely bestowed upon the exalted. They lauded Ku, and Iris cautioned him that public knowledge of such a skill would provoke the ire of artisans. The slimes disclosed their ambitious vision for the city, still under completion. Ku, however, chose to hold the urban developments in abeyance, opting instead to inform the Adventurers' Guild. Returning to Anan City, they sought out Milia at the Guild. However, the receptionist revealed Milia's current engagement in a critical assembly, her presence unattainable. Upon sharing their underground discovery, the receptionist scrambled to fetch her superiors, Following a brief interlude at the desk, they were ushered into a conference room to await a scholar from the royal capital. Upon his tardy arrival, Ku was taken aback by the scholar's youthfulness. The scholar who introduced himself as Larich de Hubert, the third scion of a ducal household apologized for the delay. Despite his aristocratic standing, Larich declined formal gestures of respect, advocating for egalitarian treatment, and eagerly solicited details about the subterranean city. After their arrival at the entrance to the underground city, Larich begins to develop an unhealthy fascination with the Orichalcum door, which unsettles Iris. Ku steps forward to open the door, and it greets him as Master, causing confusion for Larich. Ku then discloses the fact that he is indeed the master of the underground city, a revelation that leaves Larich utterly astonished. Once inside, Larich notes with surprise that the city hardly resembles a subterranean environment. As he observes the area meticulously, a helper slime approaches and greets them, which startles Larich. Aware of their status as ancient magical creatures, he can hardly believe he is encountering one. When Larich inquires if the slime constructed a nearby house, he learns from the slime that it was Ku's doing. This solidifies Ku's claim of being the master, capable of creating anything he desires in this place. Larich initially thinks the city, despite its name, is devoid of life. 
he expresses gratitude to Ku for bringing him to the city and offers to assist him with any needs. On entering the house, Ku poses questions about ancient civilizations, leading Larich to detail their history. Thriving on the world 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, these civilizations possessed advanced magical technologies. The technology they currently utilize is a mere fraction of what was scavenged from those ancient ruins, including devices remarkably similar to airplanes and smartphones. However, their societies ultimately fell to ruin, along with their technologies, due to a disastrous monster known as Calamity. Iris adds that both humans and dragonfolk failed in their combined efforts to defeat this beast, which afterward entered a prolonged dormancy. Larich notes recent monstrous disturbances as potential indications of the Calamity's reawakening. Speculating on the ramifications of such an event, they are interrupted as the helper slime serves them tea and delectable snacks, astounding them with the treat's origins items pulled from its own body. Shifting the topic, Larich suggests Ku build a town as an evacuation refuge for Anan City. Approving the idea, Ku employs his creation skill to fashion an entire town, astonishing Iris and Larich. After thanking Ku, the helper slimes offer to furnish the new buildings in the style of Anan, completing the task within a mere two hours. As Ku ponders the extent of his abilities, Larich discloses to him that he's an archaeology professor, insisting Ku maintain their prior rapport. They are later startled by a sudden tremor, which prompts another helper slime to arrive with urgent news. They follow it to find a massive magical stone pillar that has emerged from the ground. After Ku, Iris, and Larich observe the massive black crystal, the slime informs them that the crystal has emerged from the earth. Ku and Iris discern a magical circle on the crystal's surface, reminiscent of the one on the Orichalcum Golem they previously battled. Upon touching the magical circles, Larich is instantly transported to an unknown location. Concerned for Larich's well-being, Ku and Iris resolve to touch the crystal themselves and follow him into the mysterious realm. Ku and Iris were suddenly teleported to an unfamiliar location upon touching the crystal. Ku promptly checked his mapping skill and discovered a lengthy corridor. Larich, noticing Ku and Iris, expressed his appreciation for their efforts in coming to his aid. At the sound from behind, Ku and Iris assumed a defensive stance, only to find a slime monster introducing itself as a friendly entity. It addressed Ku as its master and presented itself as a glasses slime, a smaller form of helper slime. Curious, Ku inquired about their current whereabouts. The slime explained they were in the deep territory, a section of the underground city. This place, the slime said, was pivotal in monitoring the Black Dragon, one of the Calamity Monsters. Ku, puzzled, questioned if there were multiple Calamity Monsters. The slime confirmed the existence of numerous such creatures, with their exact number being unknown, which left Larich and Iris in a state of astonishment. The accommodating slime then informed them that their location also served as a stronghold for the seal on the Black Dragon. However, should certain conditions be met, the dragon would be resurrected. Ku felt a sense of annoyance at the prospect of worrying about a calamity monster. Nevertheless, the slime updated the group, saying the dragon was at rest between the Fado's mountains, and there was merely a ten-day window before its inevitable reawakening. After activating a magical device, the slime conducts Ku, Larich, and Iris to a chamber. The device proceeds to display historical records from 4,000 years prior, detailing the devastation wrought by the Black Dragon's attack. Vivid images of the beast annihilating an entire town with a singular strike emerge, revealing that on that fateful day, thousands of lives were extinguished within mere seconds. Everyone present is stunned by the revelation of the dragon's might. In response to the visuals, Larich informs Ku of the urgent need to relocate the town's populace to the safety of an underground city. Ku concurs with the plan. The slime predicts they have approximately three days before the dragon stirs from its slumber. After that, Ku, Iris, and Larich return to Onan City. At the Adventurer's Guild, Milia, the receptionist, warmly welcomed them back. Ku and his companions reported to her about the events they experienced in the underground city. Milia shared with them alarming news, 
there were indications of an impending stampede in the Fados Mountains. Iris took a moment to clarify to Ku that a stampede refers to a simultaneous onslaught of monsters. Milia continued, informing them that they had detected significant concentrations of magicules in the Fados Mountains, suggesting an imminent threat. She divulged that they anticipated an assault of approximately 50,000 monsters on Anan within the next three days, leaving Larich visibly shocked by the revelation. Milia then disclosed that Anan City's soldiers had fallen to another stampede three months prior, depleting the city's defenses and forcing it to rely on adventurers for protection. In light of this, she inquired whether the townspeople could seek refuge in the underground city. Ku, without hesitation, agreed to provide sanctuary for the evacuees. Following their journey, Ku and Milia arrive at the underground city, accompanied by Zitten Barden, the master of the Adventurer's Guild. Zitten expresses his gratitude to Ku for permitting the townspeople to seek haven within the underground sanctuary. Unexpectedly, the spectacled slime reaches out to Ku, visibly distraught. Ku soothingly reassures the slime, who then reveals the pressing concern. The impending stampede signifies the premature resurgence of the Black Dragon. Afterward, Ku escorts Milia and Zitten back to the previous chamber and presents the images of the Black Dragon. Both Zitten and Milia recognize the gravity of the predicament. The glasses slime discloses that there is only until the following day before the stampede commences. Ku hypothesizes that the stampede could potentially coincide with the reawakening of the Black Dragon. Zitten advises Ku of his intent to return to Anan City to organize a mass exodus. Although Ku proposes to accompany him, the glasses slime dissuades him, citing a desire to reveal something of importance to him. After that, the slime wearing glasses led Ku to a vault containing three doors. Ku inquired which door he ought to open. The slime explained that the left door was meant for a hero, the central door for a demon lord, and the right door for a sage. Ku disclosed to the slime that he belonged to none of these categories. Suddenly, a voice from the vault announced that Ko's unique status fulfilled a hidden requirement, prompting all three doors to open at once. Although the slime was perplexed, Ku decided to explore the contents of each door, starting with the left one. Inside, he discovered a shattered sword. The slime informed Ku that this was the Dragon Slayer's magic sword, which had been destroyed in a battle against the Black Dragon four millennia prior. It was said that only a hero could restore it, yet Ku was not the hero. Nonetheless, Ku chose to store the broken sword in his item box. Upon doing so, his mind was inundated with knowledge about the sword. He withdrew the sword from his item box to find it fully repaired and immensely strengthened complete with several potent effects. When the slime questioned how Ku managed to fix the sword, Ku revealed that he employed his creation skill, and by storing the sword in his item box skill, he was able to repair and enhance the now-named sword Gram. Ku listed the three effects of the sword. Firstly, the God of War's Blessing, which not only improved the sword but also imparted the ability to self-repair. Secondly, the Dragon Slayer effect which bolstered the abilities of the one wielding the sword, and thirdly, the god of war's sever, capable of delivering a fatal strike when the wielder infused the sword with mana. Ku deduced that the sword might indeed prove to be a formidable foe against the black dragon. In the adjacent chamber, Ku discovers what is, in fact, an artillery walker. The nearby slime elucidates that this contraption is an ultra-high output magic railgun designed to combat stampedes. Ku proceeds to place the railgun in his item box skill, which utterly astounds the slime with its infinite capacity. Later, Ku retrieves the railgun from the item box, only to reveal that he has transmuted it into a destroyer golem by employing his creation skill. Upon activation, the golem, which is sentient due to an advanced processing effect, greets Ku. It requests that Ku depends on it during a stampede. Ku assures the golem that he will call upon its services when the need arises. After this exchange, Ku returns the golem to the sanctuary of his item box. Ku and the slime proceeded to the adjacent chamber, wherein he discovered a shattered shield. It was identified as the Dragon God's shield, which had been demolished during the conflict with the Black Dragon four millennia prior. 
The slime suggested that Ku might have the capacity to mend the shield using his creation skill. However, Ku's attempt proved unsuccessful. He disclosed that the repair was hindered by a deficiency of materials. Pondering over the necessary material, Ku learned from the slime that the required substance was the Dragon God's Eye, a rarity emerging only once every thousand years within the dominion of the Dragon Folk. Given the limited time at his disposal, Ku harbored doubts about undertaking a journey to the Dragon Folk Nation and consequently opted to defer the endeavor for the time being. After that, Ku expresses his gratitude to the slime for revealing the location of the vault. Subsequently, the slime bestows upon Ku the blessing of the spirits and explains that this blessing will grant him their power when it is required. Ku, curious about the nature of these spirits, is suddenly enlightened by the full assist skill, which reveals that spirits are entities born from the emotions of people. Back at the underground city, Ku inquires about the welfare of the city with Iris. Iris informs him that the evacuation of Onan City is progressing well. Additionally, Ku shares with Iris the items he acquired from the vault. Upon hearing about the Dragon God's shield, Iris divulges that she left the Dragonfolk Nation in pursuit of this long-lost treasure. She explains that the shield went missing during the battle with the Black Dragon 4,000 years ago, and since then she has been seeking any ruins related to that period. Ku reveals to Iris that he has the shield in his possession and attempts to offer it to her. However, she stops him. She questions whether he can restore the shield using his creation skill. Ku replies that he requires the dragon god's eye to accomplish the restoration. Iris surprises Ku by producing the orb from her bag and handing it over to him. He uses the orb to restore the shield successfully, which results in the shield's new effect. It can only be wielded by someone possessing the dragon god's shrine maiden skill. Ku relays this information to Iris, who then reveals that she indeed possesses that very skill. According to ancient dragon folklore, a girl possessing the skill of the dragon god Shrine Maiden is born every few hundred years. This girl is tasked with two critical missions, first, to locate the dragon god's shield and second, to deliver the dragon god's ruby to the designated transferer. Until now, everyone endowed with this skill has failed to complete these tasks, except for Iris, who has become the first to do so. After Ku presents Iris with the Dragon God's shield, he observes that every requirement to reach this point seemed to have been orchestrated for him, as if someone had been meticulously arranging each step of his journey. Afterward, Ku returned to Onan City, and upon reporting everything to Guild Master Zitten, he was instructed to rest in preparation for the battle the following day. Milia entered Ku's room while he was resting and inquired if he had a moment to spare. She questioned Ku about the truth of the rumor that he and Iris must face the Black Dragon in single combat. Ku confirmed the rumor, elaborating that he and Iris would repel the dragon and the marauding monsters while the adventurers would defend the townspeople. Presenting Ku with a ring, Milia watched as he examined the inscription, curious about its meaning. She enlightened him that the ring, known as the Ring of Spirits, was a family heirloom given to her by a relative's grandfather. The heirloom came with a directive. It was to be entrusted to the individual destined to confront the Black Dragon. Just then, Ku's full assist skill alerted him that he had unlocked the skill material transmutation. Informing Milia of his newly gained ability, he astounded her with the revelation, as skills are typically ascribed at birth and immutable. As Ku slipped the ring onto his finger and found it to be a seamless fit, Milia expressed her relief at having identified the rightful recipient of the ring. She confessed that finding the ring's destined owner was partly why she worked at the Adventurer's Guild. Ku inquired whether she intended to resign now that her mission was accomplished. Milia dismissed the idea, stating her desire to witness Ku's forthcoming battle with the Black Dragon and the Stampede and to see what destiny held for him beyond that. Following their conversation, they both decided to retire for the day, taking some much-needed rest. The following day, Ku unveils the ability he acquired recently, Material Transmutation. This skill enables the creation of superior quality materials from identical substances. 
Utilizing this skill, Ku transforms the furs of solitary wolves into the more valuable fur of a Fenrir wolf. Subsequently, he employs his creation skill to fashion a Fenrir coat. This exceptional garment provides formidable protection against both physical and magical attacks, in addition to bestowing the wearer with the grace of swiftness effect. Subsequently, Ku returns to the subterranean city where the inhabitants of Anan City have assembled. Preparing to address them, Ku greets the crowd and introduces himself. The audience recognizes him as the individual who vanquished the bear, an identity he acknowledges. Observations are made regarding Ku's kindness, which becomes evident to all. Observing the multitude of contented faces brings relief to Ku. Shortly thereafter, Milia apprises Ku of the stampede's commencement. Iris queries Milia concerning the town's evacuation status, to which Milia responds that only 70% of the population has been successfully relocated. Milia implores Iris and Ku to engage the beasts, allowing for the remaining citizens' evacuation. Both Iris and Ku consent to the request without reservation. Iris and Ku travel to the location nestled between Fado's Mountain and Anan City, the path the monsters from the stampede were expected to traverse. Ku, utilizing his item box skill, summoned the destroyer Golem in preparation for the imminent combat. Grateful for the opportunity to assist, the Golem conveyed its thanks to Ku. As the monsters approached, Iris and Ku adopted their battle stances, ready for the encounter. Ku instructed the Golem to deploy its ultra-high output magic railgun. On command, the Golem emitted a massive laser beam from its eyes, resulting in a colossal explosion among the monsters. After the Golem unleashed its explosive laser, Iris was shocked by its power. Ku revealed that he had reached level 71 and pondered whether he would gain experience points when the Golem defeated monsters. Ku and Iris decided to join the battle as well. Ku chose to tackle the left side, leaving the right for Iris. Iris proposed a challenge to Ku. Whoever defeated the most monsters owed the other dinner. Ku accepted the challenge. He tested the Fenrir coat's abilities and activated the grace of swiftness. This ability made him so quick it seemed as if time slowed around him. With one swift strike, he dispatched a black spider. Ku warned that while the grace of swiftness provided significant acceleration, it also consumed a considerable amount of mana, necessitating cautious use. Observing a black spider fleeing, Ku employed his sword's god of war's sever ability, which sent a flying slash that cleaved the spider in two. Ku was delighted to discover he had leveled up, noting the slashing power of the god of war's sever grew stronger with more magic input. He decided to unleash its full potential. Suddenly, he received a notification. The black dragon had been resurrected. Ku braced himself for the true battle that lay ahead. Meanwhile, Iris is encircled by a pack of solitary wolves. She employs the power of the dragon god's shield to fortify her defense against the wolves' onslaught. Abruptly, Ku arrives and exterminates all the wolves besieging Iris. Ku elucidates to Iris that the black dragon is en route to their location. Subsequently, the destroyer Golem conveys to Ku and Iris that he is capable of vanquishing the residual monsters from the stampede and suggests that their attention should be centered on the black dragon. Ku expresses his gratitude to the destroyer Golem for its assistance. After checking his mapping skill, Ku pinpoints the dragon's whereabouts. Subsequently, Ku and Iris resolve to make their way there. While Ku and Iris hasten toward the whereabouts of the black dragon, a colossal black orb materializes in the firmament. Ku perceives that this orb bears a resemblance to an egg just moments before its hatching. Suddenly, the orb fissures and from within emerges the black dragon, albeit in a state of severe enfeeblement. Upon detecting Ku and Iris, the dragon emits an ear-piercing wail that has a debilitating effect on those within earshot. Fortunately, Ku, blessed with the transferer's skill, remains unaffected. Meanwhile, Iris experiences some difficulty but ultimately withstands the dragon's lament. Ku discloses that, based on his appraisal skill, ordinary assaults prove futile against the dragon's hide. Only a blade forged for dragon slaying has any hope of triumph. 
Contemplating the dire circumstances had he not located the Dragon Slayer's sword, Ku steals himself for the impending clash with the cataclysmic beast, the Black Dragon. After the Black Dragon resurrects, Ku observes that it is too high in the sky for him to strike it directly. Consequently, he opts to use his flying slash. His attack manages to wound the dragon in the chest, and while the injury is not fatal, it is not superficial either. The dragon retaliates with its breath against Ku and Iris. Iris promptly utilizes her shield's barrier ability to halt the dragon's breath. Upon realizing its breath has no effect, the dragon gains altitude and then swoops down to shatter the barrier. Ku, employing his grace of swiftness ability, quickly takes Iris out of harm's way. Grateful, Iris thanks Ku for his timely rescue. Next, Ku uses his spider web ability to immobilize the dragon. Revealing that he has only 40% of his mana remaining, Ku decides to channel all of it into one final flying slash aimed at the dragon, now unable to move. Meanwhile, the dragon prepares to launch another breath attack. As both sides unleash their respective attacks, Iris intervenes once again with her shield's barrier, protecting Ku from the dragon's onslaught. Ku expresses his gratitude to Iris for her assistance. The aftermath of their clash is obscured by smoke, leaving them uncertain of the dragon's fate. Amidst their speculation, the dragon suddenly emerges from the smoke. The dragon began utilizing an unknown ability. Ku observed the sky turning black as the dragon deployed its power. He suddenly noticed his MP being sapped and learned from his full assist skill that the dragon had activated Dark Field a technique that drains MP from all living creatures within a 2 kilometer radius. Ku realized the dragon's siphoning was more potent than his MP recovery rate. Unable to rely on his God of Speed's blessing, he resolved to channel his remaining MP into one potent flying slash. Although the strike shattered the dragon's defensive barrier, it failed to reach the beast. In retaliation, the dragon unleashed its breath attack, but Iris intervened, using her shield's barrier ability to safeguard Ku. Unfortunately, her barrier shattered this time. Facing potential death made Ku contemplate. Unlike in his own world where death was an indifferent prospect, in this new reality where he relished life and forged friendships, he was disinclined to yield to mortality. Determined to survive and honor the promise of returning home he made to everyone, a turn of fate occurred. The Ring of the Spirits, a gift from Milia, activated. Following three specific prerequisites a transfer engaged in combat with the Black Dragon and a depleted MP pool, the ring unlocked its power. Ku, feeling an unprecedented surge of mana, infused it into a decisive slash. Despite the dragon's resistance, Ku emerged triumphant, subduing the formidable creature. In its final throes, the wounded dragon attempted one last breath attack. Preemptively, Ku executed another slash attack, decapitating the dragon. The creature's corpse was assimilated into Ku's item box skill securing his victory over the Calamity Monster, the Black Dragon. When the Black Dragon decimated the ancient city, the survivors engaged in a prayer that extended for three days and nights. This prayer transformed into a spirit, and although this entity lacked the power to combat the dragon alone, it was fated to emerge in the future to assist a chosen successor in defeating the beast. Following Ku's victory over the dragon, the very people who had offered their prayers 4,000 years earlier manifested their appreciation. Days after the defeat of the Black Dragon, a grand victory celebration took place. The guild master expressed his gratitude to Iris and Ku for their valorous deeds in vanquishing the dragon and thus preserving the city's safety. The throng erupted in cheers for the courageous duo. Ku, especially, found himself hailed as Dragon Killer, a moniker that accompanied the offer of libations from the grateful citizens. When the revelry subsided, a figure approached Ku and offered their salutations. It was Chrome. He conveyed his thanks to Ku for the town's deliverance. In response, Ku humbly dismissed the accolades, attributing his success to mere fortune. A reflective moment ensued, wherein Ku pondered the serendipitous chain of events that led to his triumph from the discovery of the subterranean city to the acquisition of the spirit ring and his sword. 
The gravity of how each element played a crucial role weighed on him, and he couldn't help but wonder what might have been had any piece of his journey been altered. Chrome, perceptive of Ku's disquietude, offered a reminder of previous counsel, drawing a distinction between being dealt a favorable hand and playing it adeptly. He suggested that Ku allow destiny to be his guide. Interpreting this, Ku surmised that depending on fortune could indeed become a source of strength. Chrome confirmed this notion and commended Ku for his adept utilization of the advantageous circumstances, encouraging him to take pride in his actions. Furthermore, Chrome exhorted Ku to foster self-belief, expressing enthusiasm for the future tales of Ku's endeavors. Contemplating Chrome's words, Ku surmised that placing faith in oneself could indeed prove to be wise. After the celebration, Ku took Iris out to dinner. Meeting her in the town, he was struck by her radiance in a beautiful dress, which seemed to transform her. They arrived at their favorite restaurant. Over dinner, Ku remarked on the exquisite taste of the dishes, prompting Iris to recall the previous conversation they'd had about the ancient city at that very spot. Ku pondered the different course their lives might have taken had that discussion never occurred. Iris brought up their harrowing battle with the Black Dragon, and the chilling experience of confronting such a fearsome beast, as well as the disturbing reality of other Calamity monsters. However, Ku assured her that, should another Calamity arise, he would deploy his new ability, Calamity Summon. Iris, surprised by his constant acquisition of new skills, questioned if he had obtained yet another. Ku confirmed this, explaining that upon the Black Dragon's defeat, he had ascended 19 levels, earning the Calamity Summon skill a power that allows him to call forth a tamed Calamity monster at the cost of mana. Amazed by his strength, Iris speculated whether Ku could truly be considered a regular human. Ku affirmed his humanity, but Iris playfully suggested that regardless of his extraordinary powers, she knew him to be a good person at heart. He then shared that he had encountered Milia earlier, who informed him of her impending departure to the royal capital, as she intended to join the main branch of the Adventurer's Guild. Ku also mentioned that they too would soon travel to the royal capital to receive honors for their successful subjugation of the Black Dragon. Iris conveyed to Ku that, upon departing her homeland five years prior, she had not anticipated the course her life has taken. She shared with Ku that in the Dragon Folk Nation, her presence was consistently met with indifference. At Ku's inquiry about the cause, Iris disclosed that she had a twin named Ferris. Ferris, like herself, possessed the rare ability known as Dragon God's Shrine Maiden, a skill manifesting once every several centuries. Ku, puzzled, asked if such a coincidence was extraordinary. Iris explained that while she held the skill of spearwomanship, Ferris was gifted with the skill of premonition, which afforded her a 90% accuracy rate in foreseeing the future. Leveraging this skill, Ferris attained the esteemed position of a bona fide shrine maiden. Iris recounted that although both sisters received training at the temple as shrine maidens, she was regarded merely as a replacement. At the age of 15, their temple came under monster siege, resulting in Ferris's tragic demise. A shrine maiden's duty is to seek out the dragon god's shield and bestow the ruby upon the chosen recipient, a quest Iris embarked upon with three protectors when she reached 16. Alas, three days into the journey, not only did her funds vanish, but so too did her guardians, leaving a scar upon her spirit. Ku deduced that this misfortune drove Iris to become an adventurer. Expressing gratitude, Iris credited Ku for enabling her to fulfill her mission. With the mission accomplished, Ku inquired about her ensuing plans. Unwilling to return home just yet, Iris turned the question to him. Upon learning that Ku aspired to continue adventuring embarking on a global odyssey, she expressed her desire to accompany him. Ku consented to her request. Iris conveyed to Ku that, until their encounter, she had held the belief that no one would come to her rescue, and that she was utterly alone in the world. Hence, she had used her powers merely for the sake of survival. However, she expressed that, thanks to Ku, she no longer felt adrift. She recounted how his defeat of the Black Spider and his subsequent rescue filled her with joy. Iris confided in Ku that he had saved her both physically and emotionally. 
she admitted her delight at having met him and expressed her desire to remain by his side henceforth. After dinner concluded, Ku and Iris found themselves outside. With a tinge of embarrassment, Iris requested that Ku disregard her previous words, attributing them to the alcohol and a momentary lapse. Ku confessed that the alcohol had similarly muddled his memory. Subsequently, Ku took Iris by the hand, and together they commenced their walk. After that Ku and Iris ventured into the jungle to gather materials, Ku remarked that peace truly was superior. Iris called out to him, pointing out numerous mushrooms flourishing by the water's edge, and inquired if he was interested in taking a closer look. Ku agreed and expressed his gratitude to Iris for accompanying him on his quest. Iris responded that her assistance was given willingly. Upon reaching the mushroom site, Ku suggested to Iris that they should consider establishing a formal party upon their return to the Adventurer's Guild, given their frequent collaboration. Iris hesitated, explaining that they couldn't form a party since his rank was lower than hers, yet she expressed a readiness to do so in the future. She predicted that Ku would soon be invited to join the Adventurer's Guild in the capital, at which point he could attempt a promotional exam. She encouraged him to propose a partnership at that time, and Ku agreed, asking whether she would accompany him on his journey. She affirmed. Suddenly, a flying object caught their attention. Ku inquired if it was a monster, but Iris assured him there was no danger. She elucidated that the flying mushrooms were harmless, though skittish upon detection. Ku, utilizing his appraisal skill, recognized that these mushrooms could be used to concoct flying potions. This revelation spurred his decision to collect them. While Iris proposed her assistance, Ku declined, opting instead to harness his god speed blessing to swiftly chase down the mushrooms. In a mere instant, he returned, having successfully gathered fifty-six specimens, much to Iris's amazement. Following this accomplishment, they resumed their material collection. After arriving back in on in town, Ku and Iris were suddenly approached by a young girl. She excitedly informed Ku that she was a fan and requested to take his hand. Ku, taken aback by the unexpected attention, consented. Soon after, several more individuals approached him, all of them fans, much to Iris's chagrin who commented on the troubles of his newfound popularity. Subsequently, Ku and Iris visited the Adventurer's Guild where they were greeted by Milia. She announced that their timing was impeccable and presented them with two invitation letters from the Adventurer's Guild headquarters. As Ku perused the letter, he discovered that an awarding ceremony was scheduled for the following month. Milia elaborated that the Scarlet Company would handle their travel arrangements to the royal capital and requested their presence at the company's office the next day. Ku remembered that the Scarlet Company was owned by Chrome. Iris inquired if Milia would also be in attendance at the award ceremony, to which she confirmed. However, she explained that her preoccupations in town meant they would only convene at the ceremony itself. Milia encouraged them to enjoy the journey, promising that it offered an array of stunning scenery along the way. Ku inwardly expressed his anticipation for the trip to the royal capital. Subsequently, Ku finds himself in an expansive, deserted field. He shares that his reason for being there is his desire to experiment with the newly crafted items. The inaugural item is a ring, wrought from the carcass of a black dragon and named the Ring of the Flame Emperor Dragon. This ring bestows upon the wearer the ability to wield flame magic, a specialty unique to Ku. He elaborates that not everyone possesses the capability to wield magic in this world. It requires the appropriate skill. He further explains that flame emperor magic represents the pinnacle of fire-based spells, accessible to him exclusively while adorned with the ring. Opting to demonstrate, Ku summons a fire arrow from his palm, directing it towards a tree. The projectile obliterates the tree, reducing it to ashes, while meticulously avoiding any collateral damage. Ku's curiosity leads him to assess whether the power can be harnessed for an area of effect attack. He fixes his gaze upon a patch of grass 30 meters distant and resolves to incinerate everything within a 10 meter radius of that point. The fire arrow hits its intended target, consuming precisely the designated area. Ku acknowledges the utility of this power, which eradicates only the targets he desires. 
Without warning, a pack of punch rabbits, a species of monster known for their pugilistic abilities, emerges behind him. As they assault him, Ku employs the fire arrow to decisively eliminate the threat. The arrow strikes with lethal precision, targeting their hearts and vanquishing them instantly, all the while sparing the integrity of their bodies for potential material use. Ku then advances to level 92 and observes that his status has significantly improved. Subsequently, he opts to consume the flying potion that he concocted from the airborne fungi. Upon ingesting the potion, he finds it exceedingly palatable and is suddenly aloft. He decides to elevate his position, soaring upward into the sky, and is captivated by the panoramic view. He then experiments with various methods of flight. Once the potion's effects dissipate, he descends and returns to his room at the inn. Before retiring, he employs his creation skill to craft a t-shirt of exceptional quality. Donning the t-shirt, he settles into slumber. The following day, Ku and Iris return to the underground city. Iris mentioned that, despite their numerous visits, the sight of this place remained a wondrous one to behold. Ku agreed with her. The worker slimes welcomed Ku and Iris with enthusiasm upon their arrival. Iris remarked that their next announcement might be awkward. They proceeded to explain that they would be departing for the royal capital. This news shocked the slimes, and Ku conveyed that he and Iris would be leaving for some time, and their return was not imminent. The slimes expressed their sadness at this revelation. One slime voiced its desire to accompany Ku, but lamented its inability to leave the underground city. Suddenly, Ku received a notification explaining that a rewrite of the city's main system could enable one slime to join him above ground. After Ku executed the necessary changes, one of the slimes began to glow, feeling warmth throughout its body. Puzzled, it inquired about the change, and Ku clarified that the system overhaul was underway, which would allow the slime to exit the underground city. The slime was elated at the prospect of joining Ku on his adventure. Another prompt requested that Ku name his slime companion. Iris proposed the names Osis and Suawa which Ku did not favor, but he combined them to form the name Sarara. The slime was overjoyed and expressed gratitude for its new name. Shortly thereafter, Sarara grew drowsy, a likely side effect of the systemic rewrite. The other slimes escorted Sarara to rest. One slime remained, promising to present a gift to Ku personally. Overhearing this, Ku inquired about the gift. The slime has mentioned that since Ku and Iris are embarking on a journey shortly, he wishes to show Ku something impressive. Accordingly, the slime presents five exquisite carriages that hail from the ancient city, each boasting a unique interior design. Upon inspecting the carriages, Ku discovers the first carriage to be outfitted as a kitchen. The slime indicates to Ku that another carriage contains two plush beds, and a separate one features a second level. Iris points out to Ku that should these carriages be combined, they would create a spectacular single carriage. The slime proposes that Ku employ his creation skill to amalgamate the carriages. Ku obliges. First, he stores the carriages within his item box skill, then acquires the blueprint for the new amalgamated carriage. Utilizing his creation skill, Ku fuses all the carriages into one grand, luxurious carriage. Following this, Ku receives a notification indicating that his creation skill has progressed to rank 16 and has gained a new function. Ku elaborates that henceforth, he can activate his creation skill without the prerequisite of placing materials into his item box first. Ku and Iris decide to inspect the interior of the carriage. Upon entering, they first encounter a sumptuous living room, followed by a dining room. Next, they discover the kitchen, and on the second floor, there are two bedrooms. Lastly, they find a bathroom equipped with a bathtub that exudes comfort and luxury. Ku remarks that the carriage could serve as their home. Iris, along with the slime, inquires how Ku intends to transport this substantial carriage. Ku steps out of the carriage and conjures the destroyer Golem, which greets him cordially. Ku requests the golem's assistance to carry the carriage, and the golem readily agrees. Subsequently, Ku receives a notification inquiring whether he wishes to amalgamate the carriage with the golem. He consents, and the fusion process commences. The golem merges with the carriage, resulting in the creation of the Grand Destroyer Golem. 
Utilizing his appraisal skill, Ku learns that the carriage is capable of moving at a rapid pace and surmises they will reach their destination sooner than anticipated. After discussing his travel itinerary with the Scarlet Company, Ku and his companions agreed to make their way to the port leisurely, taking in the sights of other cities along the way. Five days prior to his departure, Ku bid farewell to those who had supported him during his stay. He also took the time to clean his room at the inn, as well as to restock his supplies and ingredients. Within three days he had completed these tasks. During this time Ku received a letter from Relic. Relic wrote to inform Ku that he planned to pay a visit to Count Millard, who was currently residing in the city of Surrier. Ku noted his own interest in the Count, particularly due to the Count's inaction during the Black Dragon incident and the subsequent stampede. Relic seemed to share Ku's curiosity as this was his reason for visiting. Additionally, Relic extended his congratulations to Ku for earning an award in the royal capital, and he promised to reunite with him at the award ceremony. Ku considered the possibility of meeting with Relic in Surrier during his travels. The following day, Ku embarks on a shopping endeavor, seeking books and travel guides for his forthcoming journeys. Upon entering a store, he observes Milia, who is likewise engaged in shopping. Suddenly, Milia stumbles and plummets, her books scattering as she falls. With remarkable reflexes, Ku manages to catch her books mid-flight. He then inquires with concern, are you all right? Leaving Milia astonished by his quick response. After that, Ku accompanies Milia to her house. She thanks Ku for carrying her books and decides to reciprocate. Ku insists that he is simply returning her favor and does not require one in return. Milia expresses that she would feel guilty if she did not offer something in return. Ku suggests that if that is the case, she could consider herself in his debt. He proposes that she could repay him during the awarding ceremony in the royal capital by showing him the tourist attractions. Excited by this idea, Milia promises to do her utmost. Ku, observing her enthusiasm, notes that their time in the capital promises to be entertaining. When Ku and Iris's departure day arrives, people wave them goodbye at the gate. Milia presents Ku and Iris with a bouquet. Subsequently, they board the carriage and commence their journey, thus departing from the town of Anan. En route, Sarara joins them. Sarara appears happy, as Iris has gifted her a hat. Ku notes that with the hat on, he won't confuse Sarara for wild slimes. Sarara greets the golem, introduces herself, and inquires about the golem's name. The golem lacks a name, and observing this, Ku decides to give it one. Iris suggests the names Desdes and Tomtom, but Ku does not find them suitable and opts for the name Guest instead. With the name for the destroyer Golem decided, they continue their journey to the royal capital. On their journey, Ku and Iris made their first stop at the town of Tao, which is renowned for its beef. Ku noted that there is a thoroughfare dubbed Meat Street, where numerous meat-serving establishments stand in a row. Anticipating the visit, Ku looked forward to going there. While traveling to their destination, he took out his book and began to read. Ku remarked on the joy he found in having leisure time like this, especially considering his recent routine had been nothing but work every day. Ku woke up and realized he had dozed off while reading the book. He noticed they were close to their destination, the town of Tao. At the entrance gate, Iris and Sarara noticed a crowd and wondered if it was a welcoming party, but they soon realized the atmosphere was too turbulent. Ku suspected there might be a monster near the city. They exited their carriage and a soldier approached them. The soldier inquired if Ku was the dragon slayer, which he confirmed. Suddenly, the adventurer's guild master from the Tao guild approached them, pleading with Ku and Iris to save their town. Ku sensed trouble ahead. At the Adventurer's Guild, Ku and Iris found themselves in a meeting room along with the Guild Master, a man who introduced himself as Popolo. Ku asked about the current situation and Popolo explained that, about an hour ago, a dangerous S-rank monster known as an Evil Treant had appeared in the Northwestern Second Plains. Popolo revealed that the monster could destroy their town in half a day, and due to its quick regeneration capabilities, it was very hard to kill. He mentioned that he had requested help from traveling priests to stall the treat, 
but because the event was so sudden, they had not been able to evacuate the residents or organize a subjugation force. He then implored Ku to kill the monster, citing Ku's history of defeating the Black Dragon by himself. However, this task should be easier. Ku consented to undertake the quest but corrected Popolo on one point. He hadn't defeated the Black Dragon alone. Iris had helped him, and Sarara, who was also present, corroborated this by telling Popolo how she had protected Ku with her shield. This time, Popolo requested that both Iris and Ku work together to defeat the Trint. Afterward, Ku and Iris continued their journey to the Trint in the carriage. Upon reaching a certain stretch, they chose to stand atop the carriage rather than remain inside. Sarara, puzzled, inquired about their preference for such a precarious position. Ku and Iris explained that the elevated vantage point offered a superior view. Iris expressed her gratitude to Ku for his earlier assistance, to which he humbly replied that it was no trouble, emphasizing the value of her friendship. Iris, touched by his words, confidently brandished her shield, declaring her readiness to handle defensive duties. As they stood there, Sarara pointed out the treant, resembling an immense tree. Ku, taken aback by the sight, utilized his appraisal skill to evaluate the creature, discerning its violent nature and remarkable regenerative ability. Meanwhile, Iris identified luminescent chains binding the treant, recognizing them as celestial chains and advanced holy spell designed to restrain foes. She mentioned the rarity of spellcasters capable of such feats, deducing significant power within the one who crafted these bonds. Ku connected this information with Popolo's earlier reference to a priest. Abruptly, the chain showed signs of wear and, under the treant's formidable strength, shattered. Iris spotted the exhausted priest responsible for the incantation, who soon collapsed. With no time to lose, Ku urged Dest to accelerate and reach the priest before disaster could strike. Dest surged forward at Ku's command, and as the treant loomed threateningly over the fallen caster, Ku leapt from the carriage to rescue the priest, revealing her to be a mere child. Iris noticed that the treant was about to crush Ku and the priest beneath its massive foot. Swiftly, she activated her shield's dragon god barrier skill to protect them. Ku expressed his gratitude to Iris for her timely intervention. Meanwhile, Sarara assured Ku that she would attend to the priest. With this assertion, she expanded her slime form substantially in size, enveloping the priest with her enlarged body to transport him safely to the carriage. Ku and Iris, undeterred, rejoined the fray. Checking in on his companion, Ku inquired about Iris's condition. She responded that despite requiring some rest after their earlier encounter with the dragon, she was holding up well. Ku then requested Dest to create a safe distance between them and the treant. In compliance, Dest maneuvered the carriage away from the looming threat. Sensing they were now at a secure range, Iris deactivated her barrier. Taking advantage of the momentary reprieve, Ku retrieved his dragon slayer sword from his item box. He decided to launch a flying slash at the treant, which effectively severed its leg. However, to Ku and Iris's astonishment, the treant's leg instantly regenerated, a testament to its extraordinary healing abilities. The treant then propelled the branches on its body like projectiles toward Ku and Iris. Ku employed his Flame Emperor skill and incinerated every branch into dust before they could approach. Iris found the spectacle of the burning branches remarkably beautiful. She inquired when Ku had mastered that skill, to which he replied that he had acquired it recently. Iris suggested that if Ku could wield fire magic, it would considerably simplify their predicament. She elaborated that there were primarily two strategies for vanquishing a treat. The first entailed a drawn-out confrontation that relied on sheer force, persistently assailing the creature until its regenerative abilities were outstripped. Ku pondered whether he could simply keep hurling airborne slashes at the treant, though he recognized it would be time-consuming. Eager for an alternative, he inquired about the second strategy. Iris explained that incinerating the treant's head with fire magic would prevent it from regenerating. She advocated for this method, and Ku concurred that it seemed preferable, considering that the lengthier the battle, the greater the chance of an unexpected complication. 
Noticing that the tree resembled a mammoth tree, he sought clarification from Iris about where its head was located. She pointed to the face on the upper section as the target. Ku acknowledged the strategy, but observed that due to the tree's considerable size, he would need to close in on it. He proceeded to extract an item from his item box, which was disclosed to be a flying potion. Ku informs Iris that he concocted the potion using the flying mushrooms they had gathered previously. If consumed, the potion grants the ability to fly. Iris inquires whether he intends to use this potion to soar upward and assault the treant from above, which Ku affirms. As he prepares to take flight, Iris expresses her desire to join him. She proposes that while Ku concentrates on the offensive, she will focus on defense. Ku consents to this plan. After Ku ingests the potion, he receives a prompt inquiring if he wishes to extend the potion's effects to Iris as well. He agrees, and together they ascend into the sky. Iris experiences the sensation of flying as odd yet reassures Ku that she isn't afraid, drawing comfort from his presence. Acknowledging that Iris places great trust in him, Ku resolves to live up to her expectations. He then instructs Dest to find safety. Dest consents, wishing them luck before retreating with the carriage. While Ku and Iris were flying, Ku noted that he needed to get closer to the treant to ensure his fire arrow was within range to attack. Suddenly, the treant charged towards them, taking both Iris and Ku by surprise. Ku realized that his killing intent had been detected by the treant, prompting the creature's aggressive approach. As the treant hurled a punch in their direction, Iris promptly raised her shield barrier to intercept the blow. She urged Ku to seize the opportunity, and without hesitation, Ku channeled all of his remaining mana into one potent fire arrow aimed at the treant. As Iris lowered her barrier, the path was cleared for Ku's fire arrow to strike its target. After Ku unleashed his flying slash on the treant, it was evident that the treant had been completely destroyed. Subsequently, Iris and Ku returned to the carriage to inspect the condition of the priestess. Iris expressed relief upon finding her unharmed. Ku's attention was drawn to a crest emblazoned on the priestess's attire. Recognizing the crest, Iris divulged that it symbolized the god of war and hypothesized that the girl could potentially be a priestess of that faith. Additionally, Iris observed that the crest featured a sword reminiscent of Ku's own blade Graham. Just then, Dest announced their arrival at the northern gates. Ku, Iris, and Sarara, accompanied by the priestess, alighted from the carriage. Ku then proceeded to store the carriage in his item box. At that moment, an individual approached Ku, inquiring if he was the famed dragon slayer, to which Ku confirmed. Upon turning around, a gathering came into his view. Questioning the purpose of the assembly, he was informed by the man that the crowd had originally intended to assist in the defeat of the treant. However, since Ku had single-handedly vanquished the creature, their presence was no longer required. The man professed his gratitude to Ku for the salvation of their town, prompting the crowd to spontaneously decide to hoist Ku aloft and transport him into the township as a celebration of his heroic deed. The festivities commenced with the crowd enthusiastically bearing Ku into the town. Following his victory over the treant, Ku proceeded to the Adventurer's Guild to formally report the event to Popolo. Once informed, Popolo assured Ku that he would relay the news of the impressive feat to the Adventurer's Guild headquarters. He also conveyed his deep appreciation to Ku for his role in safeguarding the town. In turn, Ku humbly acknowledged that he could not have triumphed without the assistance of his companions. Popolo, recognizing Ku's modesty, became convinced that true heroism was embodied in individuals like him. Ku and Iris made the decision to explore Meat Street in Tao. There, they indulged in various meat dishes and found the cuisine exceptionally delectable. While they dined, Ku overheard a pair of individuals expressing their gratitude towards him for vanquishing the threat that had plagued their town. Though somewhat embarrassed by the public's attention, Ku acknowledged that the praise didn't displease him. On the contrary, he felt a sense of accomplishment. After their meal, Ku and Iris proceeded to the moon viewing pavilion, an inn where they planned to spend the night. The following morning, Ku rose before the others 
Taking advantage of the quiet hours, he elected to employ his creation skill using remnants of the devil trained they had defeated previously. First, he utilized his dismantle skill to fashion devil trained branches from the creature's left arm and transform its lower body into devil trained stems and roots. From these materials, he created a Yggdrasil branch, a limb from the divine tree Yggdrasil, which bears sacred power and upholds the world. As Ku reflected on the mythical tree, often referenced in games and movies from his former world, he realized he had yet to conceive a recipe for the Yggdrasil branch, though he was hopeful it might emerge later. Subsequently, Sarara woke and assured Ku he would be ready shortly before heading toward the washroom. Ku, curious about a slime's morning routine, followed Sarara and observed him examining his reflection in the mirror and striking poses, clearly pleased with his perfectly round shape. After Ku and Sarara met with Iris, they proceeded to the northern part of Tao and discovered that it was merely an ordinary district. However, in the southern part, they came across a tranquil pasture. Sarara was excited to see cows, and Ku was surprised by the stark contrast between the cities north and south. Ku and Iris participated in a competition to shear a sheep, where Ku performed admirably and Iris was perplexed. They also sampled some ranch cheese. As Ku strolled around the ranch, people began to recognize him as the dragon killer. Before he knew it, they had organized a banquet in his honor. On the town wall, Iris inquires of Ku regarding his sentiments on being hailed as this town's hero. Ku confides in Iris that the warm reception he received was beyond his expectations. He observes that the town grew to its current stature over an extended period. Furthermore, he acknowledges that his protection extended not merely to the city's inhabitants, but also to the progression and achievements they have amassed over time. Afterward, Ku and Iris returned to the Adventurer's Guild to inquire about the priestess, but she had already departed, leaving behind a letter for Ku. In the letter, the priestess expressed her gratitude to Ku for rescuing her. She identified herself as a traveling priestess who had been visiting Tao when she heard about the Devil Trint's assault and volunteered to confront it. The letter also mentioned that Ku and Iris had come to her aid just as her magical power was reaching its limit. Moreover, she assured that she would make it a point to express her thanks to him personally in the near future. At the conclusion of the letter, she disclosed her name as Lily Luna Lunaria. Ku mused that a future meeting between them would be remarkably coincidental, given their nomadic lifestyles. Subsequently, Ku and Iris resolved to partake in lunch, choosing a meat sandwich. However, this was no ordinary sandwich, even the bread had been substituted with beef steak. Such an all-meat creation astonished both Ku and Iris, for they had never encountered anything like it. Nevertheless, they ventured to taste it and discovered it to be exceptionally savory. As they dined, Ku imparted to Iris that their journey the following day would lead them to Surrier, a town renowned for its hot springs. Ku expressed his eagerness to immerse himself in a hot spring, considering it the essence and soul of the Japanese culture. In anticipation of their early departure, they opted to retire early that evening. The following day, at the town's gate, Ku and Iris were preparing to leave when numerous townspeople gathered to bid them farewell. Ku appreciated the warm send-off. Subsequently, they boarded the carriage to continue their journey toward the town of Sarir. Sarara and Iris decided to take a nap, leaving Ku to ponder how to occupy his time since everyone else was sleeping. Noticing the pleasant weather, Ku stepped outside the carriage and asked Dest if it would be all right for him to remain there, to which Dest readily agreed. While reading a book and enjoying the weather, Ku spotted Lily in the distance. He requested Dest halt the carriage momentarily, which he did. Upon disembarking, Lily inquired if he was Ku, and upon his confirmation, she introduced herself formally, expressing gratitude for Ku's intervention in the perilous incident days prior. Ku assured her it was no trouble and questioned why she was present. Lily explained that her motivation was simply to thank Ku in person. Ku was curious if she had been awaiting their passage at that particular location. Lily revealed her possession of a skill called foresight, which enables her to foresee future events in her dreams she had envisioned Ku's carriage passing by. 
Ku was taken aback by her admission and inquired if she indeed followed her dream to that spot, to which she affirmed. She felt it would be discourteous to disregard her dreams, a sentiment Ku internally noted as evidence of Lily's impeccable politeness, since she remained courteous even toward her own skill. Lily then broached the subject of the transmigrator's skill, catching Ku off guard. She explained that her dream had also instructed her to pose this question to him. Ku was uncertain how to respond. Lily added that she possesses a skill known as the God of War's Shrine Maiden. If Ku indeed carried the transmigrator skill, she had essential information to impart and an item to bestow upon him. Ku observed that upon hearing Lily possessed the shrine maiden skill of the god of war, his thoughts immediately turned to Iris. Notably, Iris was endowed with an ability known as the dragon god's shrine maiden, along with the duty to deliver the god's red jade to the transmigrator. Consequently, he speculated that Lily might bear a similar obligation. While in the carriage, Lily elucidated to Ku that the Shrine Maiden of the God of War is a rare skill, manifesting in humans only every few centuries. This skill enables her to unlock the potential of items bearing the God of War's name. Iris chimed in, comparing it to her own ability, the Dragon God's Shrine Maiden skill. Subsequently, Sarara contributed to the conversation with her knowledge, stating that the combination of someone possessing the Dragon God's Shrine Maiden skill with the God of War's Shrine Maiden skill would result in something extraordinary. Ku, curious about the nature of this extraordinary result, inquired further, only to learn that Sarara did not have the specifics. Lily then proceeded to draw forth a bow from within her robes, divulging that her purpose, as the Shrine Maiden of the God of War, was to bestow this bow upon the Transmigrator. She further disclosed the existence of an emblem of the God of War, which depicts three sacred weapons imbued with the deity's essence, the magic sword gram, the Yggdrasil bow, and the unmarked holy spear. The bow she presented, the Yggdrasil bow, she revealed, was one of these venerable weapons. Ku utilized his appraisal skill to evaluate the bow, discovering its name, the Bow of Calamity Slaying. He learned it is a formidable weapon against calamity monsters, with a prerequisite that only bearers of the transmigrator skill can wield it. Additionally, the bow's power is currently dormant. Storing the bow in his item box, Ku pondered whether its seal might one day be broken. Iris recognized the bow as the Yggdrasil bow belonging to the Grand Temple of the Holy Land, typically showcased only once every fifteen years during a major ceremony. She questioned Lily on the prudence of removing such an artifact. Lily confessed she was authorized to distribute the weapon as part of her mission to the Transmigrator, feeling relieved to hand over the bow to Ku. Inquiring about her other duties, Ku learned her next task was to locate the magic sword Gram. He promptly retrieved Graham from his item box to Lily's astonishment, revealing he already possessed the sword. Lily inquired of Ku regarding the location of his discovery of the sword, to which he responded that he unearthed it underground in the vicinity of Anan City. He posed the question of whether he might retain possession of it, and Lily informed him that the sword Graham was also among the weapons bequeathed to her care. Nonetheless, she granted him permission to hold on to it. Iris inquired of Lily whether she possessed the skill of foresight. Lily affirmed she did and recounted how the ability had preserved her well-being numerous times since her youth. Iris expressed her gratitude for the revelation and mentioned the similarity between Lily and Iris' own sister Ferris, who was also blessed with the same talent. It was Ku who discerned that Iris was alluding to Ferris, prompting Sarada to question Lily about her future plans. Lily disclosed that her directives had been to safeguard the transmigrator following the completion of her assignments. She queried whether the group would accept her company on their voyage. Ku was amenable to the idea, and upon seeking the concurrence of Sarara and Iris, who shared his sentiments, he warmly invited Lily to join their fellowship. Lily, in turn, was immensely thankful for their welcoming gesture. Iris inquired of Ku whether it was time to have lunch, and upon her suggestion, they all agreed to begin preparing a meal. Ku disclosed that he had procured a variety of ingredients from the town of Tao as a souvenir and decided to create a dish using them. Iris, Lily, and Sarara all volunteered to assist in the meal preparation. 
Ku then informed them that they would be preparing beef stew with tomato sauce, a cheese omelette, and banana yogurt, a combination which had been recommended to him by his full assist skill. While cooking, it was discovered that Sarara possessed commendable culinary skills, which was fitting for a helper slime like him. Iris was also accustomed to the kitchen arts. Lily, however, had no prior experience and sought guidance from Ku. They commenced with cracking eggs. Lily attempted it, but lacked knowledge of the requisite force, resulting in inadequate cracks on the first two tries. Resorting to use her hands for the task led to the shell shattering and mixing with the egg's contents. Apologizing for the mishap, she was reassured by Ku who proposed a collaborative effort. With Ku's assistance, Lily learned to apply the correct force to neatly crack an egg and separate the shell from the contents. Ku encouraged her to attempt the task independently. Meanwhile, Iris remarked on the pleasure derived from cooking collaboratively, an observation with which Ku concurred. Then Ku and the others continued to prepare the meal together. Once it was complete, they started eating. After taking a bite, Iris commented on how delicious the food was. She revealed to Lily that Ku had once assisted at a restaurant in Anan. Everyone there had loved his cooking, remarking that it had a special taste. Iris suggested to Ku that if he were to open a restaurant, it would be extremely popular. Lily concurred with Iris, noting that the food was indeed delicious. She confessed that it was the first time she had eaten food of such high quality and that she found cooking to be enjoyable. When Ku offered Lily seconds, she initially declined. However, Ku reminded her that as a child in the midst of growing, she needed to eat plenty to grow strong. Apologetically, she then asked for a second helping. After Ku and the others finished their satisfying meal, they worked together to clean the utensils. Lily confided in Ku that, while in the Holy Land, she had focused solely on her responsibilities as the God of War's shrine maiden, and consequently, she had never participated in such mundane tasks. Apologetic for her lack of worldly experience, Lily received Ku's assurance that there was no need for apologies as he admired her sincerity. Lily then disclosed that she had lost her parents to an epidemic at a very young age, and while she had no memories of the event, her role as the Shrine Maiden had led to her being embraced by the God of War's faith. She expressed her deep appreciation for this community, which had been incredibly kind to her, and her desire to give back through the fulfillment of her missions. Iris chimed in, urging Lily to embrace the joys of life more freely, considering her youth advice that Lily accepted with a nod of agreement. As Sarara was about to speak, the carriage suddenly began to tremble. Dest informed them that an earthquake had struck, and he would need to perform an emergency stop. This abrupt halt caused Sarara to be hurled toward the carriage wall. However, Ku swiftly caught her before she could collide with it. Ku then inquired about everyone's well-being and received confirmation that everyone was unharmed. Iris expressed her concern to Ku, hoping that the bridge would remain intact despite the significant earthquake. Ku, curious about the bridge, learned from Iris that it lay ahead. Named the Zard Bridge, it was an ancient structure with a rather dilapidated appearance. She further explained that should anything have befallen the bridge, they would be forced to take a lengthy detour southward, delaying their arrival in the town of Surir by several days. Ku acknowledged that their itinerary involved spending three nights and four days in Surir, and a major detour would completely disrupt their plans. Upon reaching the bridge, they discovered that it had indeed sustained damage. Upon Ku and his companions' arrival at Zard Bridge, they discovered that it had suffered damage due to the earlier earthquake, and a group of people was gathered there, apparently stranded. Lily pointed out the challenge they faced in crossing the compromised structure. Ku observed that the river's rapid current rendered swimming across it an insurmountable risk. Iris proposed that he employ a flying potion for the crossing. However, Ku was concerned about abandoning the others who were also intent on crossing. It was at this juncture that Surara presented a potential solution. He recommended Ku utilize his creation skill to mend the bridge. Ku considered this, acknowledging that his advanced skill level permitted him to invoke the skill through mere touch. Yet he pondered the likelihood of an appropriate recipe materializing. 
Upon contact with the remnants of the bridge, Ku activated his skill and in a brilliant display reconstructed the bridge from its own ruins. Ingeniously, he incorporated the trunk of a devil treant into the new design, enhancing the bridge's durability and functionality. The newly established New Zard Bridge, as it came to be known, possessed a remarkable feature. It could autonomously defend against approaching monsters by extending its branches and roots. Additionally, this innovation ensured that the bridge was impervious to aging and would serve as a secure passage for all who traversed it. After witnessing Ku's abilities for the first time, Lily expressed surprise at his power. Iris informed Lily that it was typical for Ku to accomplish tasks in an extravagant manner. Sarara commented that Ku seemed godlike, but Ku modestly credited his skill for his achievements, downplaying the extent of his efforts. Subsequently, they crossed the bridge without taking any detours. By the time they arrived in the town of Surrier, dusk had set in. At the town's guard station, a guard showed his gratitude to Ku for renovating the Zard Bridge. He assured Ku that he would report his actions to Count Maillard and that Ku would receive a generous reward. Ku didn't initially grasp the significance of repairing the Zard Bridge, but the guard explained that the bridge served as a crucial transportation link and would ordinarily require substantial manpower to restore. Upon learning that Count Maillard was present in town, Ku inquired about the truth of this. The guard, appearing concerned, inquired how Ku had come by this information. Ku explained that he had received the news in a letter from a noble acquaintance. The guard confided that the Count was in town to recover from an illness, but implored Ku and his companions to keep the matter confidential. Ku agreed to the request and the guard thanked him for his cooperation. The guard apologized for the interruption and then extended a welcome to the group, inviting them to enjoy the town of Surrier. Before they entered the town, he mentioned that their stay of three nights and four days should give them ample opportunity to visit the hot springs. Additionally, he informed them of the upcoming celebration, marking the 300th anniversary of the city, which was scheduled for the following day. Entering the town, Ku observes that the town is bustling with activity. Iris mentions that a grand festival is slated for the next day, to which Ku responds with astonishment that the town has been in existence for 300 years. Iris elucidates that the origins of this place trace back to an ancient city, whose ruins were repurposed by the people three centuries ago to construct this town. Adding to the discussion, Sarara shares his knowledge, explaining that a metropolis named Sasan thrived here 4,000 years prior, complete with an underground facility that generated hot springs. He speculates that the facility might still be operational, which would account for the town's moniker as the Hot Spring Hub. Sarara then advises Ku to value him as a resourceful slime, prompting Ku to suggest that as compensation, they ought to indulge in a feast of delectable cuisine. Subsequently, Ku and his companions proceeded to the White Pot restaurant to savor the town's specialty, known as Hodup. Sarara, Lily, and Iris all appeared eager to sample the cuisine. On tasting it, they found it exceptionally delicious. Ku likened the dish to the French cuisine's pot au feu. Iris was particularly enamored with the soup, while Sarara and Lily relished the meal. They discovered that each restaurant in the city imparts its own unique twist to the hodup. Resolving to explore this culinary diversity, they planned to visit other establishments the following day. Their gastronomic adventure led them to consume six servings of hodup, leaving them immensely content as they returned to the inn. After that, Ku proceeds to the hot springs to rest and finds them quite enjoyable. On the women's side of the hot spring, Lily and Iris are also taking a relaxing bath. Like Ku, they are deriving pleasure from the experience. Ku decides to partake in the enjoyment of the festival the following day, and Sarara, who is beside him, concurs with his decision. After the arrival of tomorrow, Ku and his companions attend the festival. Iris takes note of the numerous food stalls. Ku inquires whether Lily desires anything from the stalls. At first, Lily does not respond, but after Ku calls her name again, she startles. Apologizing for her distraction, Lily listens as Ku asks if something is preoccupying her thoughts. 
She divulges that the previous day, her foresight ability was unintentionally triggered, yet the vision she received was fragmented. Curious, Ku probes for details. She explains that her vision involved Ku receiving a trumpet amidst a crowd, a scenario Ku finds quite peculiar. Subsequently, Lily describes a sight of Ku extracting a shiny green branch from his item box. Recognizing it as the Yggdrasil branch he possesses, Ku ponders its intended use. In a final revelation, Lily describes a scene where their entire group is departing Surrier via carriage headed northwest. This information perplexes Ku they are scheduled to travel northeast to their next destination. Upon consulting his mapping skill, Ku acknowledges the Northwest is only comprised of mountains and forests, leading him to question what business they could possibly have there. Lily admits the limited scope of her foresight, noting such an unclear vision is unprecedented. Ku inquires if her visions are typically more explicit, to which she confirms they usually possess much greater clarity. Sarara then disclosed his understanding of the circumstances and informed them that the future of a person who possesses immense power like Ku is likely to fluctuate. Therefore, when it concerns events including such individuals, they cannot see clearly and the visions yield indistinct outcomes. Iris mentioned that Ku has always been extraordinary, while Ku observed that since Lily's foresight ability has never failed to materialize, perhaps these visions are indeed the confirmed future. Lily concurred with his assessment. Iris pointed out that, if that were true, then Ku should anticipate receiving a trumpet very shortly. Ku mentally acknowledged that, although he has never played a trumpet before, his dexterity skill should enable him to play it proficiently. Afterward, Ku decided to join the others in enjoying the festival, beginning with a visit to all the stalls. They then proceeded to sample some food, with each person choosing different dishes. Iris and Lily relished their meals, whereas Sarara fell ill due to the wine in his dish. Concerned, Iris inquired about his well-being, only to discover that Sarara had inadvertently become drunk. Ku quickly provided Sarara with an antidote potion, which, upon consumption, restored him to normalcy instantly. Following this mishap, they opted to partake in an ancient-style lottery game. The game operator handed them a paper replete with numbers. Sarara recognized the sheet and explained that the game, known as numbers in ancient civilizations, requires players to match five of the vertical, horizontal, or diagonal numbers to win a prize. Ku noted its resemblance to a bingo game. It was soon revealed that the grand prize was a travel voucher for a luxury cruise to the royal capital, departing from the fort port. The runner-up prize was a trumpet. Upon seeing this, Iris and Ku immediately realized that this was a manifestation of the foresight which had shown Ku receiving a trumpet. After learning about the game's prizes, Ku, Iris, Lily, and Sarara sat down, eagerly anticipating the start. Soon, a clown, who was revealed to be the game master, made his entrance and proclaimed the beginning of the game. Ku's attention was drawn to the clown. Recognition dawned on him as he realized that this clown was, in fact, the same guard they had encountered earlier. With a flourish, the clown began to spin the wheel, and the first number to appear was 29. Ku glanced at his paper sheet, a smile forming on his lips when he noticed the number it matched his own age, a good omen indeed. Abruptly, the number 29 on his paper conjured a hole, as if by magic. The clown, showcasing his aptly named skill, Magic Trick, divulged that he had woven his magic into everyone's paper sheets. This enchantment meant the numbers could unpredictably alter, be overwritten, or even exchange places. Ku mused that typically in a bingo game, the participants tend to diverge into two distinct camps as the game progresses. The first consists of those who find joy in the game's abundant opportunities, while the second comprises individuals prone to boredom, their spirits waning to the point of forfeiture. Ku aligned himself with the former. Sometime after, the number 61 was announced. Lily had it on her sheet, but Iris, lacking the same fortune, seemed less than pleased with the game's progression. Nonetheless, as the numbers were called out, luck continued to favor Ku. The clown informed the participants that they should announce reach upon having only one number remaining. 
When Ku exclaimed, reach, indicating that his paper sheet lacked a single number, the clown was intrigued about Ku's potential winnings. Simultaneously, another participant, Cal, declared she also had one number left. She acknowledged Ku warmly, revealing a prior acquaintance. Ku explained that he and Cal had embarked on adventurous quests together in Onan, a fact that surprised the clown. As the game progressed, it turned out that the subsequent three numbers called were on neither Ku's nor Cal's sheets, meaning they did not achieve bingo. When the number 87 was called, Ku noted that 88 would have secured his victory. However, he anticipated the near miss, respecting the foresight given by Lily that his fate was to win second place. Unexpectedly, through the clown's magical trickery, Ku's last number transmuted from 88 to 87, leaving him perplexed, as this alteration implied he would now take first place, contradicting his expected second position. Upon this revelation, Cal disclosed that she too had reached bingo, resulting in a tie for first place. The clown applauded their success but highlighted a predicament. There was one each of the first and second prizes. He left the decision to Ku and Cal. Without hesitation, Ku chose the second prize, to Cal's astonishment. He reasoned that his journey to the royal capital was imminent. Consequently, the clown awarded the first prize to a delighted Cal. Cal expressed her gratitude to Ku for allowing her to secure the first prize, and then the clown signified the time to award the second prize. He prompted Ku to extend his hands, and to everyone's astonishment, the trumpet representing the second prize materialized in his grasp. Iris could not hide her disappointment at not winning anything, and both Iris and Lily lamented the lack of additional prizes that would have given them a chance at victory. Approaching Ku, Cal inquired whether she had caused him any inconvenience, but Ku reassured her that all was well. Echoing his previous intentions, he confirmed his plan to depart for the capital by himself, and mentioned his proficiency with the trumpet was no cause for concern. As if to prove his point, Ku began to play the trumpet with astonishing prowess, casting a spell over the onlookers with the entrancing melody. Sarara identified the tune as Sassin's Slumber, a notoriously intricate piece to perform, which left Iris, Lily and Cal astounded at his musical ability. Ku then disclosed that he was utilizing his full assist skill to master the playing of the trumpet. After bidding farewell to Ku, Iris, and Lily, Cal hurried away, explaining that she had previously arranged to have lunch with her grandmother. As she departed, a voice called out to Ku. Turning around, he was greeted by an elderly man who introduced himself as Randolph de Maillard, the ruling lord of the Maillard territory. Lord Maillard expressed his gratitude for the opportunity to meet Ku, renowned as the Dragon Slayer. Ku was aware that Count Maillard had been suffering from an illness and had been recuperating in the town. Curious about the nature of the Count's affliction, Ku noted the clear signs of Count Maillard's poor health. The Count disclosed his knowledge of Ku's heroic deeds, which included vanquishing the Black Dragon, defeating the Devil Treant, and reconstructing the Zard Bridge. During the conversation, the old man was suddenly seized by a coughing fit, prompting Ku to inquire about his well-being. Lord Maillard apologized for the distasteful display and revealed that there had been a severe flood in the north about four months prior. Since the flood, he had been undergoing a therapeutic hot spring treatment in Surrier to heal his injuries, although he confessed to still feeling unwell. Nevertheless, Count Maillard offered his support to Ku should he ever require assistance, as a token of gratitude for Ku's invaluable contributions to his territory. As they were about to shake hands, the Count was overwhelmed by an intense coughing spell and collapsed. Ku, concerned, questioned his health once more, only to witness black smoke emanating from the Count. The black smoke converged towards Ku, but was thwarted by a barrier that prevented it from making contact with him. Ku received notification that a high-level curse was detected and subsequently blocked by the transmigrator skill's state abnormality nullification. Both Iris and Lily were taken aback by this revelation. Lily recognized the curse as one typically inflicted by a monster, while Iris, concerned about the contagion, inquired about Ku's well-being. He assured them he was unharmed. As Count Maillard's guard approached to examine him, Ku cautioned against getting too close, citing a significant danger. 
Ku wondered about the Count's condition, then received a notification that the curse analysis was complete. The curse, known as the Black Death, was identified as lethal and highly contagious, with the potential to cause extensive damage. It was advised that Ku use the Yggdrasil branch to commence the suppression process. Without delay, Ku retrieved the branch from his item box. Lily recalled seeing it in a previous vision. Utilizing the branch, Ku managed to dissipate the black smoke. Upon being asked if the curse was lifted, he clarified that it was merely temporarily suppressed, ensuring it was no longer a threat to those in the vicinity. Subsequently, they resolved to escort the Count to a secure location. After that, Ku, Iris, Lily, and Sarara, accompanied by Count Maillard and his guard, left the square and proceeded to the Shadow Cow Pavilion Inn, guided by the Count's guard. Upon arrival, and with the inn's cooperation, they successfully transferred the Count's unconscious body to a bed. The Count's guard, concerned, inquired about the Count's condition. Ku clarified that the Count was afflicted by the curse of Black Death, which is activated when the victim visits a crowded place. Once triggered, the individual has approximately three hours to live, and within that time frame, the curse can spread to nearby individuals, resulting in fatalities similar to a rampant epidemic. Ku further disclosed that the curse is a unique ability of a creature known as the Elder Lick. After Ku's explanation of the curse, the Count's guard clarified that four months earlier, during the Great Flood in the north, Count Maillard had confronted a skeleton monster. However, he failed to kill it. Just before the skeleton departed, it pointed at the Count and uttered words in a language impossible for a human mouth to produce. The guard theorized that this incident marked the moment the Count was cursed. Lily subsequently implored Ku to allow her to employ her magic in an attempt to dispel the Count's curse, citing her proficiency in the highest level of light magic. Ku acquiesced and Lily initiated the casting process, intoning the necessary chants. Midway through her spellcasting, she discerned that the spell exerted no influence, leaving the Count still afflicted, which dumbfounded her given her spell's purported potency. Ku queried about the specific magic Lily had utilized, to which she responded that she had cast the most formidable of the light spells, renowned for its capability to eradicate any curse. This led Ku to speculate whether the curse was indeed indomitable. At that juncture, he received a notification indicating that the curse's analysis had concluded. Lily, eager for information, questioned if Ku had uncovered any insights, and he shared that the only means to annul the curse would be to eliminate its originator the Elder Lick. The whereabouts of the Lick posed a conundrum to Lily, magnified by the Count's guard's admission that there had been no sightings of the Elder Lick since the Great Flood, which Ku found particularly troubling. Then, both Ku and Iris recommended that Ku should employ his auto-mapping skill to locate the Elder Lick. Sarara noted the synchronicity in Ku and Iris's thoughts, telling them that they were thinking alike. After deploying his auto-mapping skill, Ku discovered that the Elder Lick resided on Mount Triss. Suddenly, the Count awoke from his sleep. Subsequently, Ku and the others briefed him on the events that had transpired and informed him about the curse. The Count disclosed to Ku that a great flood four months prior had struck a severe blow to his family's knightly order, nearly leading to its annihilation. He further revealed that the security of his territory was temporarily in the hands of the Adventurer's Guild and that it would take multiple years to restore. He explained to Ku that his heir was still youthful and that his untimely demise would plunge the Maillard territory into chaos and an uncontrollable situation. With no alternative, the Count implored Ku to assist him in vanquishing the Elder Lick and even started to beseech his aid. The guards also joined in, pleading with Ku to save the Count. Ku recognized that once the effect of the Yggdrasil branches wore off, the curse would begin to proliferate, an outcome which could be catastrophic. Therefore, he resolved to accept the plea and aid the Count in defeating the Elder Lick. After that, Ku, Iris, Lily, and Sarara set out in a carriage towards Mount Triss to defeat the Elder Lick. During the ride, Iris remarked to Ku that their current circumstances closely mirrored the events foretold in Lily's prophetic dream. Ku had acquired the trumpet, utilized the Yggdrasil branch, and now they were en route to the northwest of the city, precisely as Lily had described. 
Iris found Lily's foresight ability remarkable and expressed her gratitude. However, Lily humbly attributed it to her skill foresight. Iris observed that Lily's modesty was reminiscent of Ku's past demeanor and shared with Lily that Ku often downplayed his own talents, a trait less commonly displayed these days. Ku then imparted wisdom to Lily, explaining that although many people might possess the same skills, their effectiveness depends on the individual. He emphasized that one's skills are intertwined with their identity and the manner in which they utilize them. Lily took solace in Ku's counsel. Afterward, Ku, Lily, and Iris disembarked from the carriage to traverse the forest on foot. When they approached the mountain, Ku consulted his auto-mapping skill and determined that their destination lay within the cliff. Given his past experiences with similar situations, he quickly recognized what needed to be done. With the use of his item box skill, Ku deftly revealed a concealed door hidden behind a rock on the cliff face. Lily, intrigued by his actions, inquired how he knew the door's location. Ku shared that he had encountered similar scenarios before. Upon examination, Ku noticed a disparity in the emblem adorning the door from those he had seen in the past. Lily, recognizing the emblem, identified it as the insignia of the Calamity Cult. She informed him that this cult was a pagan religion that originated in the era of an ancient civilization and, as the name implies, they revered Calamity monsters as deities. Sarara interjected to share his insights, detailing how the ancient civilization 4,000 years ago had been poised to combat a Calamity monster. However, the efforts were consistently thwarted by the Calamity cult. He speculated that this location may have served as one of their strongholds. Ku remarked on the poor taste the elder Lick must have had to choose such a place for residence, but he also acknowledged that liches are typically formidable sorcerers who attained immortality through magic. Ku theorized that this Lick could have been affiliated with the cult millennia ago. Regardless of the elder Lick's true identity, Ku recognized that their objective remained unchanged. Sarara opened the door, and they all entered the hidden stronghold. Upon entering, Ku and his companions encountered a door. Ku observed an inscription on the doorframe which read, Number 3 Underground Worship Center. Sarara expressed her astonishment at Ku's ability to decipher the language of the Calamity Cult. When questioned by Ku about the inscription's meaning, Sarara explained that it indicated the place was one of the larger edifices among the Calamity Cult's churches. Sarara further informed him that the cult had been constructing dubious facilities worldwide, and that its adherents would gather in the worship center to conduct rituals in honor of the Calamity Monsters. She also revealed that the path leading to the worship center was designed as a labyrinth replete with traps, meant to eliminate intruders or those who disrupted the rituals. Understanding the extent of the cult's security precautions, Ku contemplated the nature of the rituals they performed, while Iris remarked that she preferred to remain ignorant of such matters. Ku checked his automapping skill to discern the pathways through the labyrinth. He discovered a maze-like structure and realized that navigating it would take some time. Aware that they couldn't afford to waste a moment, owing to the curse that loomed over them like a ticking time bomb, Iris suggested that Ku utilize his route-finding ability to seek a path. However, Ku had a different plan in mind. He retrieved a wooden hammer from his item box, revealing that it was an artifact he crafted upon his arrival in this world. The hammer possessed a unique bonus, making it of little use to him until now. This bonus granted the hammer the power to destroy walls. Exerting this ability, he struck the labyrinth's wall, creating an opening large enough for everyone to pass through. Knowing the entrance to the second floor was centered within the maze, Ku resolved to forge a direct path by demolishing the walls with his hammer. As he carried out this task, Sarara remarked that Ku seemed to derive an excessive amount of pleasure from the activity. After that, Ku and the rest managed to reach the stairs, saving a considerable amount of time in the process. Upon entering the second room, they discovered it was equipped with a falling ceiling trap, apparently activated by stepping on certain tiles on the floor. Ku, prepared with the solution, drank a potion of flying and swiftly flew to the next room with Iris, Lily, and Sarara in tow. 
they then encountered a room designed as a magical laser trap, long and narrow, outfitted with ten orichalcum turrets on each side, totaling twenty. Ku, ready with a solution for this challenge as well, used his axe to throw at the turrets, effectively destroying them. Reaching the final room of the second floor, they felt a heaviness in the atmosphere. Sarara disclosed that the room was under a high-level curse, which could be temporarily dispelled by pouring magic power into the central crystal ball. However, there was a catch. Someone had to continuously channel magic power into the crystal to keep the curse at bay. This revelation of the cruel trap angered Ku. And with that, this video concludes. The name of the manga featured in this video can be found in the description. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, like, and comment. See you later.